We humans go to a lot of trouble to get a mate. We spend both time and money making ourselves attractive to the opposite sex. We're dedicated followers of fashion and obey the rules of courtship, even if they endanger our very lives. Then, if the mood is right and the chemistry works, we form a partnership. But when it comes to sex, animals have been playing the mating game longer. After all, every animal only exists because their parents shared an attraction and mated. In nature, the reproduction game has a single aim, to leave as many offspring as possible. Humans have learnt to use appearance, behaviour and even money to attract a mate but we've still got a lot to learn from animals. After all, they've been playing the mating game a lot longer. To understand the biological basis for love, attraction, jealousy, and even crimes of passion, we only have to look at the animal kingdom. For animals did it first. We humans use every trick in the book to attract the opposite sex. Because our dominant sense is sight, we look and we find beauty in the face, lips, cheekbones and of course the eyes. If you think about it, we humans rarely caught the opposite sex by displaying our naked bodies. Instead, we cover ourselves in perfumes, paints, powders and fancy clothes. Making yourself eye-catching is done for one reason, to attract a mate. So the first stage of the attraction process is to ensure we look our best. Often this involves a good clean and makeover. Animals are no different. They too like to look their best for that potential partner. Birds will spend up to two hours a day preening. Cleanliness is so important to birds that mutual preening has evolved as the main expression of commitment between couples. Mammals are meticulous about cleanliness, especially in the cat family. Primates spend up to an hour a day grooming themselves and others in their group, using hands or teeth to remove parasites from those hard to get at places. Those animals that don't have hands or claws are unable to clean themselves. But some fish have evolved a clever strategy to ensure they get a good scrub. Australian unicorn fish have formed a remarkable association with small, cleaner wrasses. The unicorn fish literally queue up at designated cleaning stations. When their turn arrives, the rats remove any parasites. That's all very well, but who wants to approach a predator ten times your size and risk getting eaten? A communication system has evolved. The unicorn fish change colour from dark to light to signal they're ready to be cleaned and will keep their mouth shut. It's a win-win situation. The cleaner wrasse gets a meal and the unicorn fish a scrub. The alliance can be so strong that the cleaner fish will even venture into places most wouldn't dare. Once grooming is complete, the next stage of the attraction game is decoration. Being a naked ape, we require clothes to keep warm. But ever since we learnt to weave cloth, some 13,000 years ago, we've also used clothes for adornment. Today, manufactured fabrics come in every colour, pattern and design imaginable. And there's an astonishing range of jewellery available to complete the look. Many animals have built-in decoration. 
and bold colours exist in nature, either to attract a partner or to warn others that you're poisonous. Fur has unique markings, so individuals of a species can recognise each other. Feathers contain every pigment and design imaginable. Usually it's the male bird that's brightly coloured to lure the female. Butterflies display brilliant colours for recognition and sexual attraction. Butterfly eyes are highly sensitive to all the colours we can see, plus the ultraviolet light beyond our range. Some species have plain colours on the underside of their wings for camouflage, but are bold coloured on top to attract a mate. Others repel would-be predators with conspicuous eye spots. The colours in butterfly wings come from thousands of minute scales laid a bit like roof tiles. Some of them are tinted by built-in pigments. Others are iridescent. Their irregular shape makes them appear to change colour depending on the direction of the light. A different means of generating colour is adopted by primitive underwater creatures. Bioluminescence is achieved by controlling the refraction of light with minute lenses and shutters to give the appearance of brief flashes. Some animals also decorate themselves. Hermit crabs move to a bigger shell once they've outgrown the old one. But for added protection, they embellish themselves with stinging anemones. Anemones are willing partners in the association because they can eat scraps left behind by the crab when it feeds. The anemone moves onto the shell of its own accord. And eventually the crab shell becomes decorated with a living security system. A male bowerbird decorates his nest in order to attract a female. So whilst the male may not be brightly coloured like other species, he makes up for it with his creativity. He constructs a nest about three foot or one metre high and six feet or two metres wide. Next, he garnishes it with colourful and shiny accessories. The brighter and shinier, the better, because a female will select the male who uses the most impressive decorations. The male bowerbird is one of a kind. It decorates its home more elaborately than any other species except man. In addition to grooming and decoration, smell is an important attractant. Humans tend to mask their natural scent with perfume but many other mammals emit scents called pheromones. These are chemical calling cards that can lure a mate. The scent connoisseurs of the animal world are the moths. The female European vaporer moth uses the tip of her abdomen to release her perfume into the wind. Six miles or 10 kilometres away, the male locates her position thanks to his oversized antennae. These antennae have 20,000 sensory cells designed to detect this one chemical. Just one molecule of the female's pheromone is enough to entice him to pursue her. As he homes in on the female, his feathery antennae comb the air for her chemical trace. Once he's found her, he releases his own perfume to help persuade her to mate. The completion of mating is determined once both sexes stop giving off their scent. The male moves on to find another mate, whilst the female is left to lay her eggs. 
In scorpion flies, it's the male that produces a pheromone. It's released from the scorpion-like tail that gives this species its name. This male is interested in a female, and he shows it by preventing her from eating. It may seem mean, but it's all part of his mating strategy. Once the female is suitably hungry, the male shows his interest by releasing his pheromone into the air. The female gets the message and approaches. The pheromone is making her receptive to sex, but she won't mate with him until she gets a meal. The male makes her a ball of saliva packed with nutrients. Once the female has found the spitball, she starts to eat it. This gives the male time to mate with her. The larger the spitball, the longer she'll stay eating. Once mating is complete, she moves off and the male attempts to bribe another female with food. In butterflies, it's also males that release the mating scent. The wings play a vital role in courtship. Initially, a male identifies a female by her wing patterns. But it's then that scent becomes more important than sight. Male butterflies possess scent-emitting scales on their wings. In some, these are visible as a pair of light patches on the forewing. In others, by darker patches on the hind wing. Once an amorous male spots a female, he goes after her. When she realises that she's being followed, she adopts a seductive straight line flight to ensure that her suitor doesn't lose sight of her. Once the male catches up with the female, he flies around her and showers her with scent. This entices the female to settle. Next, the male uses his wings to fan his scent towards her. Some species also dispense their scent by hair pencils at the tip of their abdomen. The final stage of courtship involves the male fluttering above the female and releasing more scent. Once she is seduced, the male envelops her body with his. Competition amongst males is intense. So some males resort to force to get a mate. But for most couples, it's gentle seduction that leads to sex. But looking and smelling right isn't enough when it comes to securing a mate. You also have to know the rules of the courtship game. In humans, it's the woman who invests most energy into raising young. That's why when it comes to choosing a partner, women are more selective than men. It's the guy that must court the girl in order to win her heart. Showing off to impress the opposite sex isn't a uniquely human trait. Animals the world over have many ways of saying, my genes are best, pick me. Some males display to the female using semaphore. That's why the male long-headed fly has a metallic coloured body and white wingtips. This male has found a female and starts to display to her. Unfortunately for him, her attention is divided. The males fight for the right to court the female. The victor returns to attempt to dazzle her with his display. In real time, the exhibition is frenetic, but slow motion reveals what's really happening. The male first manoeuvres behind her. Then in front. And finally, he passes directly over her during a controlled flight. His efforts are not in vain. She accepts him and they mate. But like his semaphore, it's over in a flash.
Just as we humans give off signals indicating our desire to mate, so do marine creatures. For the harlequin shrimp, courtship is like flag waving. The male signals his interest from a distance by waving his large petal-shaped front claws. The female watches closely. A semaphore conversation follows and the couple edge nearer to each other. The male approaches, believing he's made all the right signals. But this female makes it clear to him he's been too cheeky. She literally gives him the flick. In Australian giant cuttlefish, the mating signal is flashing colours and patterns. This three foot or one metre long male has found a smaller female he's interested in. Now he must persuade her to mate. He flushes to her seductively and she responds by turning red. Their bodies talk to each other with a series of colour changes. The display seems all the more remarkable when you consider cuttlefish can only see patterns. They're colour blind. A rival male tries to interfere with the courtship but fails to stop the couple from mating. During copulation, the male places a sealed sperm packet inside the female. Given half a chance, a rival male will attempt to extract sperm from the impregnated female. So the successful male stands guard until the female lays the eggs. humans sometimes sing to woo a potential partner. Animals have been serenading their loved ones for millions of years. As night falls, male North American toads call out to females. The advantage of using sound over sight is that animals don't need to see each other so can court and mate in the dark. Following mating, the female enters the water to spawn her eggs. The beautifully coloured strawberry frog lives in the rainforest of Central and South America. Each male calls to summon a female and also to warn other males to stay away. But it doesn't always work. This male stops to listen. His rival is too close for comfort, so he decides to see him off. The show of force persuades the intruder to leave the territory. The female frogs will select the male with the loudest and sweetest call. So the male does his best to make his song appealing. It works. The female moves off to find fresh water in which to spawn. She lays only two eggs that hatch into tadpoles. And unlike most frogs, the mother strawberry frog carries them with her as she disappears into the forest. The most renowned animal vocalists are the birds. Studies have shown that the songs of many birds are akin to language. Some warbler species construct songs by combining the calls of over 70 other birds. But when it comes to composing original songs, the nightingale is the master musician. It mimics the calls of other birds and combines them in a 
totally unique way. No two Nightingale songs are alike, and some of their songs last for up to 10 minutes. We humans have been dancing since we learned to walk upright over one and a half million years ago. Animals have been dancing for a lot longer. Mayflies hatch from freshwater ponds early one summer morning. They all emerge together on the same day to maximise the chance of meeting a partner. And this is the only day they will ever experience, for by tonight, they'll all be dead. Those that survive initial attacks from predators take to the air to perform a courtship dance. The males swarm around the females, and these in turn select males that stay aloft the longest. Some mate in the air, but most fall to the ground to consummate their partnership. The pregnant females then fly upstream to lay their eggs. These are released into the water where they fall to the bottom and hatch into nymphs. As night falls, all the adult mayflies die. In just one day, millions of mayflies have lived, loved and died. For mallard ducks, the courtship dance includes moving the head up and down. This colourful male is particularly energetic with his head bobbing. The female shows her interest by bobbing back. But the male isn't a gentle lover. He bites the back of her neck to subdue her. In great-crested grebes, heads move from side to side. First, the couple shake their heads in a rhythmic display. Next, each takes a piece of weed or stick in their mouth and performs what's called the weed ceremony. They repeatedly elongate their bodies and dance using a series of ritualised postures. If the weed dance follows the correct sequence, the birds will mate. On Australia's Great Barrier Reef, a beaked leather jacket couple communicate their desire to mate through dance. The ritual involves wiggling their fins and pirouetting around each other. The result is a beautiful courtship display with carefully synchronised movements. After several hours of dancing, if all has gone well, the female retreats to the seafloor to lay her eggs and the male will release sperm to fertilise them. In seahorses, it's the male, not the female, that gives birth. But first, he has to persuade a female to give up her eggs. The male shows off his swollen pouch to the female to persuade her to transfer her eggs. But before she will consent, the couple goes through an elaborate courtship dance that can last for several days. When it's time to mate, the seahorses throw their heads back in perfect harmony. They then carefully align themselves so that the female can transfer her eggs into the male's pouch for fertilisation. The male will incubate them for one month before giving birth. Males go to a lot of trouble to impress females, even to the point of risking their lives. Smoking and drinking are good examples of life-threatening behaviour. We know that both are bad for us, so why do we feel compelled to do them? The answer is found in nature. 
50,000 years ago, men probably showed off their manhood by challenging a lion or a tribal enemy. Today, they also do it by risking their lives. The smoker's kiss may taste awful and the drinker may end up impotent. But the signal is thought to impress females because the male is seen to be risking his life. A behaviour that entails no risk can be cheated on, since even an inferior male can do it. This explains why dangerous behaviour by males can be impressive to females. The male is saying, I can do this, I'm not afraid, and I'll survive. In nature, males advertise what may seem like a handicap for the same reason. This explains why male peacocks have evolved a four-foot or one-and-a-half metre tail. Despite the fact that this could impair the peacock's survival, it's one way of conveying to the female that he has superior genes. As expected, the females select the males with the biggest tails. Glue a long tail to a short-tailed male and the females will still select him. To woo the smaller and plainer female, a male peacock raises and vibrates his tail. This has the effect of making the eye spots look more impressive as the iridescent feathers shimmer in the light. The goal is to dazzle the female and put her in the mood for mating. An albino peacock has little chance of impressing a female despite his large tail. For without shimmering eye spots, the female won't mate with him. The male of the Scottish Capercaillie grouse also boasts a large tail. But this isn't to impress females. Instead, he uses it to show off to rival males. The turkey-sized male is the world's largest grouse. The females are much smaller and lack the large tail. Several Capercaillie males gather around for the right to mate. Each male embarks on a strange display that involves jumping in the air and fluttering. This flamboyant posturing is meant to scare off rival males. But fights are still frequent and can even be fatal. This time, the victor chases the loser out of his territory. It was worth all the trouble. For as long as he can display dominance, he will get to mate with all the hens. Displays of male aggression, especially when they're dangerous, show a female that a male has the right stuff, genes worth having. That's why a male hen harrier performs daring aerobatics. He flies high and then plummets to the ground, only pulling out at the last moment. The imposing sea eagle has a 13 foot or 4 metre wingspan and exceptional agility. No wonder the males show up to the females by performing aerobatics. When a rival male enters this one's territory, the resident male attacks. First, he tries to knock the intruder out of the air. When this fails, he attempts to lock talons. The two then perform an aerial display to determine territorial rights. Risky behaviour by males is only one courtship strategy. Another is romance. In humans, charm and commitment go a long way to securing a mate.
a male that bears romantic gifts may even gain an edge over males that use more obvious displays of masculinity. It's the same amongst animals. Mating in spiders is a perilous affair, especially if you're a male nursery web spider. This darker coloured male has every one of his eight eyes on the lighter coloured female. If he doesn't follow the rules of the courtship game to the letter, he'll become a meal instead of a mate. He decides to bring a gift. The male wraps a fly in silk and offers it to the female as a present. It's accepted. Once her fangs are firmly embedded in the meal, the male moves into the mating position. Male spiders transfer sperm by inserting large palps into the female's genital opening. The palps expand like balloons during mating. Once the male has finished mating, he must make good his escape. This one even has the nerve to take the food parcel with him when he leaves. Bearing gifts is one approach. Taking a female out to dinner is another. That's exactly what this insect does. A female thinned wasp climbs up a stalk. She's wingless, so must release a pheromone into the wind to attract a male. A winged male gets the message and approaches. But before she'll let him mate with her, she wants a dinner date. The male ferries her to a flowering plant that's lush with pollen. As he feeds, she hangs onto the tip of his abdomen. There she feasts on pre-digested food. After the dinner date, the male flies her home. He's a true gentleman. Whether by courtship displays, signalling or giving gifts, animals form partnerships and mate. And in nature, copulation can also take on many forms, from the aggressive to the gentle. Sometimes males adopt brute force. At other times, there's mutual consent. But in birds, many couples stay together for life. Biologists have studied them to determine if their relationships parallel human partnerships. A perfect example of a monogamous couple is the fishing osprey. Once a male and female have mated, they stay together forever. To keep their bonds strong, the couple copulate as frequently as possible, up to 200 times in the three weeks leading up to egg laying. There's a good reason. If the male is to invest several months each year towards parenting, he needs to be absolutely sure that he's the father. He aggressively defends his female. An intruder that dares to enter his territory is immediately chased out. The dogfight was in earnest. Hunger might encourage the female to seek another mate, so the male must also hunt and bring back enough food for both of them. While her partner is away, the female repairs the nest. Later that day, he brings home fresh fish for dinner. Despite their lifelong partnership, the male osprey faces a dilemma similar to the male of many species. He must weigh up the advantage of feeding his mate against the risk of being absent while hunting. Can he be sure she will remain faithful while he's away?
This poses a question. Is it in human nature to be monogamous like ospreys? Biologists believe the answer is no. As a species, we generally form long-term relationships and are faithful to our partners. But sometimes this isn't the case. Surveys and DNA testing have revealed an amazing fact. As many as one in every 10 children born to couples is conceived outside the partnership. Science has revealed that for the few days each month when a woman is fertile, there may be a biological drive to seek males other than her long-term partner. In effect, the woman is gene shopping. And because it's common in nature, experts believe that extramarital sex may well be an integral part of human mating. To understand more about the biological basis for infidelity, scientists are studying animal societies similar to our own. More than chimps or gorillas, birds have a closer social order to humans. Like us, South American egrets form lasting monogamous pair bonds and live in a society where both parents help raise the young. But in this colony, it's common to find both sexes being unfaithful. The adulterous male egret tries to have it both ways. He'll stay with his partner on the nest long enough to make sure that he's the father. But once he's away from the nest, the male sows as many wild oats as he can. As many as one in three males is regularly unfaithful to his partner. But female egrets also play the game of sexual cunning. They mate with other males while their partner is out gathering food. It's a sort of divorce insurance. If her partner fails to return, the female will have another mate to rely on. It's not surprising that males go to a lot of trouble to prevent females from being impregnated by another male. A male damselfly enters the communal swarm and grabs any female he can find. But before mating, he scoops out the contents of her genital opening with a penis that's a cross between a spoon and a brush. Only then does he inject his sperm. After all, there's no point taking care of a female who's laying someone else's eggs. The male then takes her back to the water so she can lay her eggs. Leaving nothing to chance, he hovers over her while she's underwater. The female lays eggs twice a day for a week or more. Over that time, she'll mate with several males, and no male can be sure he's the father of her offspring. But the process must work because damselflies have been on Earth for over 200 million years. Another strategy to ensure you're the father is stay with your partner every minute of the day. Usually that's not practical, but try telling that to a yellow dung fly. On a fresh cow pat, the males sit, waiting for a female to arrive. One of the males subdues a female and carries her to the grass to mate. The couple then returns so the female can lay her eggs in the cow pat. But several other males are queuing up to intervene. The prospective father must fight them off. He holds down the female until the eggs are laid because he's determined to make sure that he's the father. Slow motion reveals that the male uses his middle pair of legs to hold the female in place and his other four legs to fend off attackers. Even while the female is laying the eggs, he still restrains her. As all the males want the same thing, it's common to see them piggybacking on top of all the females. But standing guard over a female for 24 hours a day is exhausting. 
In many species, rules have evolved that allow males to know which one of them has the right to mate with the females. In the hippopotamus, ritualized combat first takes the form of baring your teeth at an opponent. If this doesn't work, males resort to thrashing their heads. Usually, this is intimidating enough for one male to retreat. If not, hippos will bite each other. It's common to see scars on males, and they can even fight to the death. In the deer family, it isn't teeth that are used to threaten a rival, but horns. Two male impalas jostle as each attempts to spear the other. Those with larger horns, such as mountain goats and ibex, adopt a more ritualised approach. These ibex aren't trying to hurt each other. It's more a game, where each player tries to scare his opponent into submission. That way, nobody gets hurt. Elephant droppings may seem an unlikely place to call home, but not if you're a giant African dung beetle. Dozens of beetles arrive within just a few minutes of the dung being dropped. Competition is intense, so dung beetles are very possessive of their prize. Fights over ownership ensue. But dung beetles are well armoured. They embark on a ritualised fight where only one can be the winner. However, things get complicated if two opponents attack you. The winner rolls his prize into a ball so it's easy to transport. Every few turns, the beetle climbs up to have a look around to check there are no rivals. A dung ball is such a valued possession that even during a fall, the beetle refuses to let go. The final stage is to bury the dung ball as food for later. And it takes just one hour for all the dung from one elephant dropping to be buried or dispersed. European adders also practice ritualised combat. Here, two males are fighting over the right to mate with a female. But the idea isn't to hurt your opponent. Like most animals who have the power to inflict serious injury, they never lay a fang on each other. The goal is to try to pin down the head of your opponent. It's more like arm wrestling than gladiator combat. The winning move is so quick that only slow motion shows what happened. One male manages to force the other down. The exhausted loser is unable to raise his head. He slinks off into the undergrowth, leaving the victor to claim his prize, the female. Despite the rules of ritualised combat, things sometimes go wrong and deaths occur. And the commonest cause of homicide is male sexual jealousy. But man isn't the only one to murder his own kind. Lions will deliberately kill males of another pride, but they usually spare the females. During territorial clashes, a chimpanzee group will exterminate a rival one. They'll even plan to do so. Male gorillas fight for the ownership of female harems. The victim may kill the loser and all of his children. An amazing four out of every ten infant gorillas fall victim to infanticide. One version of same species murder is cannibalism. And the most infamous cannibal of them all is the praying mantis. 
Mating is the most dangerous time of all for a male mantis. The smaller green male must make exactly the right approach to the larger brown female. He moves in with caution and adopts the mating position. Mostly mating is a successful and non-violent affair. This male has stuck to the rules and gets to mate. But just when he thinks everything is going to plan, he makes one wrong move. Now that she has his sperm, the female decides that he might be more useful to her as a meal. It's either that or she'll bite his head off to increase his sexual vigour. The female is twice his size. She devours his body piece by piece using her sharp mandibles. But there's an even more bizarre cannibal. At the first sign of rain in the desert, the male North American spadefoot toad calls out to females. It's an urgent cry because the toads must mate and spawn before the water dries up. This couple wastes no time mating. They attach fertilised eggs to a plant. The spadefoot's eggs hatch within two days. The tadpoles break free and start feeding furiously on organic debris. It's the start of a race where the odds are as high as they get. They grow quickly, developing from egg to toad four times faster than the average amphibian. The fastest growing tadpoles develop a horny beak, used to eat the flesh of slower growing tadpoles. If you're a spadefoot tadpole and you don't grow quick enough, you risk being eaten by your brothers and sisters. This lifestyle may seem barbaric, but it's a good way of ensuring that available food is concentrated in those tadpoles most likely to succeed and grow into frogs. The adult frogs burrow underground to repeat the cycle next time it rains. Although attraction has its sinister side in some animals, for most, courting, mating and raising a family is a fairly straightforward affair. In this program, we've seen that when it comes to beauty and courtship, animals did it first. Even behaviour that many of us think is uniquely human. Showing off to attract a mate, infidelity, even murder. All these can be seen in the animal kingdom. So what is it that makes the human race special? Experts believe religion, spoken language, drug use and self-destruction are specifically human hallmarks. But we have one other unique trait, kindness. Humans have the unique gift of empathy. We're the only known species to practice altruism, and we help not only our own kind, but other species as well. We can literally feel the pain of others and then choose to help them, even if it threatens our own survival. So what we're doing here, helping these little guys, is uniquely human. As we move forward into an uncertain future, it's empowering to know that it's our ability to do good for others that separates us from every other creature. If we can truly embrace this unique gift, then life on this planet will be in safe hands.